All right, so what I have is I have a bunch of layers. Um, welcome back. Uh, previously, I did the uh, the 3D portions of this painting, and now I have the uh, the basic uh, render, which is that. Uh, uh, you can see the alpha output is set up there. I've actually just used the alpha to cut the background off uh, from the render. So all I've got here is just uh, the raw render itself without any of the overpainting. A nice little black background to work with. This is a map of the uh, inner sphere that I didn't end up using, but uh, I'd already done at this point a certain amount of editing on the layer just to make sure that some of the, uh, the portions of it that I was working with weren't... Uh, as you can see, they're separated a bit there from each other. I just went over it with a like a, a big fuzzy feathery um, brush. Now I have these here as placeholders. This is essentially just going to be used as a color reference, really. Um, you may recall the original image had uh, and this uh, these flames here. Once again, both of these images are just like free. Uh, uh, pictures that I grabbed off the internet. They're not, uh, they're public domain. Uh, and at any rate, I'm not really going to use them or not use them for their intended purposes. Those flames, I was thinking of having flames, but then I kind of realized that uh, at the end they might be a little bit better as a, uh, like a smoke haze dust kind of thing. Uh, and I pulled the foot out because this guy's going to be stepping over terrain, but I left the ambient occlusion uh, in place there for the entirety of that uh, it's going to be a little bit more useful than the actual uh, foot itself and then I've got my uh, what I've done is a little bit of a practice run on the highlight layer there uh, I don't end up really keeping that I keep it for a while but uh, I don't end up keeping it because as time goes on you get a little bit more used to what you're doing and you kind of get into the groove and at this point this is a, a, a practice layer and I, I hadn't really done much to it so that's what it looks like though just by itself on top of the background and then that is just the the render itself without the ambient occlusion layer on it uh, <laughs> right now I'm actually just sort of hunting and pecking and searching around for some functionality because I've been using Photoshop since I think I still have a version of Photoshop 6 from like 1995 uh, God, I don't even know when the original one I used was maybe Photoshop 3 uh, but I still have a very old copy of it, and up until recently I've been using um, CS3. They got rid of some of the stuff that I'd, I'd been used to using. I used to use variations to change colors and stuff all the time. And uh, now, I don't know how, many, how much money I've spent on Photoshop over the years, but at the moment now, I've have to guess since I'm using uh, Creative Cloud, I have to pay a subscription fee. Which, to be honest, is kind of dumb when you've paid as much money into their, their business as I have. But uh, what I'm demonstrating there is just uh, that uh, the uh, highlight layer as a separate layer, I can pretty much change whatever I want in that final color layer, the, uh, the render layer, uh, in order to change color schemes or whatever else. Um, it ends up, you end up with a very robust kind of image and you can, you can change it afterward. So here, turning all the layers back on, once again, those flame layers and that explosion layer, those aren't, those aren't going to stay in the image. Uh, the explosion is primarily there uh, just as a, a, like a color guide for how I'm going to actually paint the explosion that's in the background of the final image. So here, what I'm doing, this is, this is the, uh, the original creation of that first basic uh, highlight layer. And uh, it's it's workmanlike, but it's not exactly what I was looking for. Uh, and I, I hadn't really gotten to the groove of the piece yet. Uh, every piece that I do, uh, the more you work on it, the more time you spend on it, the more you'll get into the groove of what it is you're trying to create. Um, a lot of this, I mean, it's pretty good, but it isn't, it's not really satisfying. It's not really what I was looking for. But some of it I did keep. Like, I think I did keep a good portion of what's up there on that SRM pack. Um, 
anything from here on in. I didn't end up keeping the, this was just basically a test. Uh, I was trying out what sort of what sort of colors I would use on the uh, the PPC. Uh, but uh, like most of the initial practice stuff that I did, I didn't end up keeping it. I didn't spend a lot of time on it. I just wanted to see what I would be getting, uh, given if you look uh, up here, uh, what all of these uh, uh, illuminations and reflections uh, were as they're coming from uh, a light that I actually put there. But what I'm doing now here, and this is something that is going to stick. It's a little fast and loose, but it is something that's going to stick. Uh, this is uh, chipping. And uh, this is something that uh, physical modelers do as well is uh, when you either you chip away at an overpainted layer uh, like a paint layer uh, by putting I don't know something like hairspray or whatever behind it and then chip away at it with either uh, a watered brush or like a, a brush with solvent on it and uh, that's basically what I'm doing here what I've done is I've taken the uh, the final color layer I've desaturated it and I've set it uh, with a higher brightness so that I can actually see what I'm doing through the blue paint and then I've taken the actual final color layer and I'm just uh, using my eraser to with a like a three-point brush like a basic Photoshop feathered three-point brush and I'm just pulling all of the uh, the color off of the areas where yeah I think it should be chipped and I'm doing I'm gonna go over the whole thing like this and as you can see it's pretty fast and loose it doesn't need to be very accurate uh, because later on you end up like first off scratches aren't very accurate quote unquote they're basically just random shit that's happened to the to the object so i don't need to be terrifically accurate with it uh and at any rate later on when i go over these um in the highlight layer uh and the shadow layer they're going to uh that's going to inform all of the the scratches that i've done and make it seem a little bit more uh like they belong there like at this point this is all really sketchy um kind of scratchy uh and again it's not final and uh this just brings me back to a point that i that i tried to approach during the uh the creation of the the 3d model um sort of the the idea of the arc of a, of a project because if i were to look at this right now and think that this reflected what the final version of it would look like it would be very disheartening um there's a very very long curve in the middle of any creative project where it doesn't look the way that it uh, the way that uh, it finally will uh, and you don't have this sort of pristine initial image of it that you have when you when you when you're sort of envisioning in your mind what the final product is going to look like uh, as you can see here that now that part can be a little disheartening as you can see here uh, I'm putting a lot of this uh, chipping and scratching on the feet because they're constantly in impact with terrain touching the ground uh, kicking things breaking through foliage or rock and so you try to make them look uh, very scritchy scratchy I like to think of the paint as here and what I'm doing now is I'm taking that final color layer and I'm trying to give it uh, the kind of uh, uh, level light level that you would get out of this metal and I had mentioned before that there were a lot of details that I didn't actually add on the 3D model that I was going to paint in later, like that heat sink, for example, the grating in there. Uh, it's much easier to just paint that in. The model itself isn't intended for anything really but the uh, just being the line art for this painting, so it doesn't have to have all of those details. Uh, and here I'm still going over. Um, and uh, Okay, as I was saying about paint, right? I like the idea of this paint being this is a military vehicle and this is sort of a parade paint job as you can see it's a bit glossy and sparkly so it's kind of like car paint but I like the idea of it being a very very thick paint that has taken a lot of effort to scratch off and so I'm, I'm also considering that paint and the scratches on it uh, from multiple angles of the light sources there are two major light sources at the front of the model that uh, can be providing some of the uh, the light for the edges of this chipped off paint uh, so one on the left side and then there's the one coming from the PPC so I'm trying to manage both of those at once and then afterward I'm obviously trying to also include uh, lighting effects from the the backscatter from the explosion uh, you can see there's some of the uh, the work on the the lasers there just to try and create those reflections and this this is a bit much to be honest uh, this is one of the big reasons why I, I took off a lot of that uh, uh, or later on chose to take uh, away a lot of the uh, 
the highlight layer on the, the chest and the head area of this thing is because I wasn't really satisfied with that. I think uh, I, I'd overdone done it a little bit. So here you're starting to see, as I was saying, uh, some of the, uh, the refraction, the backscatter effect of the, the light coming from the explosion. Some of these lighting angles are impossible. Uh, they don't really exist in reality, but I'm going ahead and doing them anyway because it looks more dramatic, just like all of that force perspective. So here's where I was saying before, I'm, I'm starting to take the, uh, the explosion uh, really as just a lighting reference. So th those individual tones that it has in it, I'm, I'm going to grab those. I'm going to have as many as four layers uh, for this explosion slash tunnel of light that this thing is. And I'm just going to keep going over it detail after detail. Now, this also brings me back to that point that I was making about the curve of a, of a piece of art. Because as you can see, this level of work where you're going from very, very large, not very detailed sections to uh, more and more refined and smaller and smaller brushes. These are just basic feathery Photoshop brushes. I'm using them at full opacity and flow, but uh, they're fairly large and uh, they're also responding to pressure and speed uh, on the stylus because I'm using I'm using a Wacom one for this. Uh, I'm just adding more and more of these details. A lot of these details won't endure. Uh, they certainly won't endure as they look here. They're going to get gradually refined or faded out or layered out or uh, You know a lot of the different uh, uh, Blending methods that I'll be using later on on multiple layers will get rid of some of this stuff But you can see what I'm getting at if I were to stop here I'd be dissatisfied with this I wouldn't think that this would be a good work and uh, this is one of the things that can be disheartening when you realize this is running at 16 times speed like just the 2D, 2D portions of this took something like another 12 hours of continuous work. Uh, or not continuous work, I didn't just sit here in one sitting, but you know what I mean. It was It's over several days, you can watch the date and the time change on that. Uh, so there's more and more details going in, working it in, and uh, you know, having a look. It's like when you, same thing when you're doing music, right? If you isolate a track, uh, you you lose the context for it. So you have to pull in the rest of the image, the other layers, and have a look at what it, what it looks like in context. And at the end of the day, these colors aren't necessarily going to work. So there they are. I've, I've changed them there. I've done a little bit of color editing there. Uh, and now uh, adding to this layer continuously, adding more and more details, starting to go into the little corners and crevices and adding highlights uh, and uh, lighter and darker areas. And once again, this is still not going to be satisfying. I'm going to continue to come back to this. Uh, I'll do all of these things all the way around, add in all of these little little highlights and little bits of color. And then once again, blend and edit and change them, uh, and pulling different colors out of different, uh, different parts that I've already created. And then, of course, when you're blending things with really feathery brushes like this, you're creating all sorts of intermediate tones that you can then pull out with your eyedropper. Uh, and grab all those intermediate tones and then push them back into the image. So once again, more and more detail as time goes on, just more and more and more of it. Uh, and then in the end, I'm not going to keep any of it. Like I'm not satisfied with the level of, uh, of detail that's coming out of this. This brush is, uh, is nine pixels. I normally work with a three pixel brush. Uh, and, uh, and certain kinds of brush detail that I'll use. This is just your straight ahead normal uh, feathered Photoshop brush. But as you can see, I'm really going to town on adding all kinds of details. And again, these details won't end up being visible. Most of them. Some of them will be visible, but a lot of them are going to get blended into additional layers. And once again, if you stop, you know, the, the way that you fail in a project like this is by, uh, is by giving up on it when it doesn't look like you want it. So as you can see there, I'm just going in and roughing all of that up with the, ne with the next type of brush. Getting rid of some of the uh, the stuff in the background there that wasn't uh, appropriate to it. And then, uh, yeah, what I've done there is I've done uh, like a brightness and contrast and, uh, and a hue change to it. And then I'm painting over what I just changed again. And once again, this is still just one of many layers that I'll actually end up building in order to get this explosion to look the way that I want. It's both coming in and out of the uh, of the background. It's exploding toward you, and also sort of an optical illusion, like the like the spinning ballerina uh, 
optical illusion where uh, she's an orthographic image and uh, it's it's unclear because she's orthographic whether or not she's turning to the left or to the right well in this case I wanted this to look like uh, you couldn't really tell whether it was coming in or out at you so the colors are a little bit more satisfying there um, but I've gone back and uh, faded the background in and then integrated those two layers and uh, painting that now with a with a smoke brush so rather than these basic Photoshop brushes uh, I'm using the the pressure and the speed of my stylus with a uh, 23 pixel uh, smoke brush so that gives it a little bit more of a of a confused smoky looking effect that I'll just continue to do and then I'm going to take a break from this and move on to these like so many of the you know you saw a few things earlier on like that glass there on the on the cockpit and whatever else a, a lot of stuff that's like practice runs that I'm not going to end up keeping it's the same thing here I'm just trying this out uh, not happy with which layer this is on uh, and how it's working and eventually it just gets to a point where there's just too much going on and so uh, unfortunately I failed to record the, my second shot at this but it worked a lot better because I, I sat down and I thought about what I wanted it to look like uh, where I, you know in this case I'm just doing way too much tried too many things and so uh, yeah I went back and uh, that's what I ended up with right there and then what I'm going to do here is, as I say, I was unsatisfied with uh, with pretty much the entire uh, highlight layer on the chest and cockpit. And now here I'm going back and adjusting the, the blending on the various layers of the explosion. And uh, as you can see, there's now three different explosion layers and they're, they're doing different things. And now I'm going in and I'm doing the, the shadows of what was originally that highlight layer. So I'm going to go in and shadow that and adding these two heat sinks up at the top here I do go back and revisit these a little bit later on too and then I'm going to redo all of these highlights uh, in a way that uh, I'm now a little bit more in the groove of how uh, I want these to go and uh, quite satisfied with the left shoulder the uh, the other shoulder the one that isn't visible right now so I'm just taking some of the time that I spent on that and integrating some of the some of the techniques some chips find if you if you put some black in and then you pull out uh, put some highlights on it you can give it a little bit of surface detail a little bit of uh, the the everyday damage that comes from just operation and uh, adding highlights to these weapons you can see that at, at times I'll pull away the the ambient occlusion layer uh, just to brighten up the dark spots to see what I'm working with uh, and uh, you know I'm not trying to uh, I'm not trying to paint the whole thing here what I'm trying to do in a lot of cases is just put subtle hints of detail like I don't have to create all of it I can uh, I can just put small little bits of uh, you know of, of highlights and, and shadows at different points just to just to make it look a little bit more like the materials that I'm looking for and uh, when it comes to uh, the metal, the steel, the scratched edges of the steel. Um, I find that uh, if you just rough it up a little bit like that, you can see those little bits of uh, little dots of light here and there. You can just create the illusion that the uh, that the metal has been scuffed up and and slightly damaged. And uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's a it's a trompe l'oeil. You're you're really trying to fool the eye of the viewer into thinking that there's a lot more detail in it than there is. And maybe it really is all there. Maybe it's all there in my mind, and I'm just uh, pulling out the necessary parts, like uh, you know, like the whole thing about the the angel in the uh, in the marble. So once again, just little hints of detail. They're not all going to actually be there. The viewer will fill in the gaps with their their uh, with their own mental heuristics. So this is what I actually did with the PPC. So I went in with multiple different uh, different uh, brushes and different uh, levels of detail. So smaller and smaller brushes, and a little bit of a light touch to try and create what I what I think a lightning gun as this PPC kind of is. Uh, and then a little bit of a, a little bit of a flare to it. 
And then, of course, having done that, uh, I did create a, a, a lighting object, uh, an actual light on the 3D model. But uh, I'm going to create some more highlights on some of the, some of the closer surfaces uh, just to integrate the, the color, the exact color of that, uh, of that PPC into the work. Try and make it a little bit more dramatic and a little more immediate. Once again, steel, scuffed, damaged steel. It's, it's sort of, some parts of it are slightly more polished uh, by the terrain, by the environment, and some of it is a bit scuffed up and damaged and dented. And so you want to just little, use little hints here and there to, uh, to create some of those effects. Now, now, bearing in mind, of course, that this is a painting of a giant robot. Uh, exploding in space and shooting lasers and lightning guns, you know. Yeah, I'm obviously not doing subtlety here, but I am using certain subtle effects in the process of it. So here I am creating another layer for the explosion uh, using a, uh, a smoke effect, uh, like a, 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 uh, like a, a smoke brush, and then I'm just going to block in and then add in uh, more and more of these colors and highlights and grab some of the intermediate shades and This is uh, as you can see I was talking about how it's a little bit both it's kind of coming in and going out So I'm trying to create multiple layers that I can then blend in and integrate into each other uh, With some of the opacity changes. So there's the blending techniques and then some of the uh, you'll see which ones I'm choosing for which of these layers and then uh, there'll be different opacities for different ones so that I can try and create uh, an effect that looks at once painterly, but also interesting enough. And I think at this point I've gotten to the level of it that I want. I could have stopped at any point and it wouldn't have been quite as satisfied. So now I'm getting back into the highlighting. And once again, you can see that it's, uh, it's, there's that knurling on the, from on the 3D model. Not a lot of the knurling ended up coming through, but I ended up just sort of hinting at it, just drawing little bits of it. And as you can see there, even where there are lighting effects that I already have, that the model already had, some of this I want to make it more dramatic. But the drama is not in, I don't know, maybe, I, maybe I'm definitively overdoing it because this is a giant robot in outer space. Uh, you know, this is a stompy robot thing. But uh, most of the effects, even the... Uh, even the sort of over-the-top aspects of this painting, because it's an over-the-top painting, uh, a lot of the, uh, the little effects are just subtle, subtle little changes. Just uh, subtle little things to pull out details. Like, for example, that is not what I, I thought that actuator needed to look like. I think that actuator needed to look like this. Right? And so, you know, how much did I change? How many, how many, uh, how many uh, brush strokes did I add to that? that change that effect completely so it looks a lot more like uh, like what I intended it to look like and the same thing with these sections here you just pull the panel lines out by shadowing and highlighting and uh, pulling the ambient occlusion layer in and out just to look at uh, where some of the darker portions are and sometimes I want more dramatic lighting effects but even then you see I don't go over everything I just go over the parts that need the additional detail there's more of that uh, the blue it's not, you know, the white or the, uh, or the orange that's going on there. This is reflections of the PPC. And then this part here, I had mentioned before that I didn't add a lot of detail on the, uh, the, the 3D model uh, because I wanted to add it in the 2D later on. And this isn't exactly what, this isn't exactly what Scroggins' uh, design looked like. But uh, I'm just adding this in here to add a little more vi visual interest. It doesn't have to be, there doesn't have to be much of a rhyme or reason to it, but uh, it's there to create some visual interest. And as you can see, once again, I didn't go back and paint the whole thing. I just added highlights and shadows that uh, create the effect of all of that detail being in there. You almost wouldn't even know, I mean, though it's very subtle, you wouldn't even know really that that wasn't on the 3D model itself. And here I'm just adding scratches and scuffs and dents into the... Uh, the reflection and little details like this you can see you don't have to do everything you just hint at them just uh, just hint at them they don't have to be completely over the top and as you can see all of that stuff on that actuator wasn't even there and you get this this illusion that there's actually more detail on the actuator 
than there actually is just through the adding of uh, little highlights and, and, uh, and shadows. Same thing there. I've just added another another bit of detail to the uh, to the armor and these as well. Just a couple of little bits of uh, information there, just to hint that there's some more detail in there than there really is. Same here. I'll go over these a couple of times to get them to look the way I want. You don't really have to go to town on them. You can see again that clicking on and off of the ambient occlusion just to uh, to make sure that all that's visible. And here as well, uh, a lot of the backscatter here from that uh, from that explosion wouldn't really show up at the angle that the original light is set at, but I'm trying to create more dramatic lighting effects so I can pull it all out. Uh, and you can see that there, there's almost a, a, a visible texture to that now that just comes out of a bunch of different, uh, like some color choices and uh, just uh, the choices of where to put some of those brush strokes. Same thing here. I'll go in and I'll, down at the bottom there, I'm going to pull some of the colors out of the explosion just to add some of that backscatter on the back of the leg. And it just uh, adds a little more drama. A blue object is not just blue. It, it has all of the colors that are in the environment in it. And uh, you just have to go in and gradually integrate them. This actuator here I mentioned uh, during the creation of the, uh, the 3D model that I put it a bit too low. So I actually ended up repositioning it. And uh, that's where the, when I rigged the leg, that's where the actual turning point of the, of the, uh, the knee joint ended up being. And not to labor the point, but quite a lot of this is just, uh, just the, the creation of elusive effects. You know, most of the blocking in is done in the 3D model render and most of the painting the proper overpainting is highlighting and shadowing and just making choices about how you want to create the the illusion that this thing is made out of metal that has had its paint chipped off and I didn't go into a lot of detail with battle damage for example I think maybe on my next one uh, I'll do a little bit more battle damage uh, this thing here, I wanted it to look like it was something, you know, that this is a mercenary organization that's like a, a 3025 kind of idea. I didn't want them to be, uh, uh, I didn't want them to look like they had been beaten up in battle so much as uh, uh, that they had just been uh, successful but well used, you know. But I think, you know, in my Locust, for example, I have a lot of repaired battle damage in that painting. And I think in the next one, I want to go into something that's actually, that actually looks like it's really been kicked around in battle. So bullet holes and burn marks from lasers and whatnot, but not on this one. This one's more just scuffed up. And uh, yeah, I don't know. A lot of it is over the top, but I, you know, again, this is a 1980s Kevin Long kind of inspired giant stompy robot blasting away with lasers uh, you know if it isn't uh, you know somebody riding a dragon shooting a laser gun in the air then what are you really doing and if you look at the color palette of this image too it, it it's got the same color palette uh, in its totality as like a 1980s uh, heavy metal album cover so I really am going for a certain over-the-top effect Although that's not incompatible with uh, the idea that there's a that there's a subtlety to the kind of painting and the amount of detail that you add as you're doing this. There's a lot of patience involved, but at the same time, this is not an art style uh, for the patient. <laughs> you know, I, I, I've become, I think, simultaneously more and less patient as I've gone on. I mean, I did go to art school. I, five years at least of art school behind me if you don't include just the uh, uh, art history that I did at university and then of course my time at Bohemia I spent a lot of time uh, working on my on my patience and my ability to sit down for long periods of time and just work at a single project but at the same time a lot of my technique is based on 
figuring out how to do things quickly and not having to be patient with them. You know, <laughs> this isn't quote unquote high art, so to speak. This isn't frickin' uh, Leonardo da Vinci painting the, uh, the Mona Lisa or Michelangelo painting the Sistine Chapel. This is, as I say, this is a giant stompy robot blasting with lasers in outer space. So these are some of the details, again, some of the stuff that I didn't add on the 3D model that uh, does show up in Anthony Scroggins' version. Although, as I mentioned before, during the creation of the 3D model, I like to think of these mechs as, uh, uh, you know, they, they're around, these are the steeds of, of warriors, you know, they've been around for a hundred years and passed, hundreds of years and passed through families. And so even ones that have been made in the same factories are probably been repaired over and over again by uh, by mech techs of varying levels of uh, of talent uh, you can see what i was talking about there too about just adding just hinting at uh, details that are probably not in the original image uh, yeah they've been rebuilt over hundreds of years by mech techs of varying levels of skill and dedication and uh, so even two that may have came come from the same factory hundreds of years ago probably won't look the same in their individual little details of the smaller points so you can see what i'm doing there still still just the the hint of what creates the illusion of this uh you know chipped off metal and and uh paint that uh, uh especially on the feet where there's a lot of that detail and i'm skipping ahead here because I forgot to record quite a bit of that, but nonetheless, you see what the effect was and where it came from. So here I'm building the terrain. And uh, this is actually the same terrain that I used for the uh, the Mad Cat that I did. It's just flipped. Uh, different parts of it are being used. And here I'm just going to blend this in, uh, put in the, these hills. I wasn't fully satisfied with this. This was a little bit of a, you know, happy little happy little mountain, so to speak. But uh, I managed to get it to look roughly what I wanted. And then most of the, the successful effect of this part, there you see I'm shadowing under the foot to get it to fit into the environment. And then uh, a lot of this effect is actually going to come from um, uh, the dust and then the, the uh, contrast uh, and the hue that I'm going to add onto this after I add all of these... Uh, highlights of the backscattering from the uh the highlighting from the uh the explosion on the terrain like that i think that this terrain already really handles the um the the main light from the left side very well but i needed to add the uh, the light sourcing from the explosion so i just went over those rocks and gave them highlights where it looked like they needed them from there and then some of the uh the highlights on the on the dust from the stomping of the foot and then those flames, I was actually sort of wondering whether or not I wanted to use those flames as flames or whether I wanted to use them as a dust effect. And I ended up going instead of flames with a dust effect. Because as you can see, what I'm about to do with the terrain is I'm about to hue and brightness and contrast it into really looking like a, uh, like a, like there may, might be a dust storm coming in in the background as this thing is stepping over the terrain. Then it's force perspective. It's a very dramatic effect. You can see there I didn't use the uh, the inner sphere background. And that's the completion of the 2D work. So now we will look at the final product.